Hey, Team Healthy. How you guys doing today? All right. Cat's out of the bag. I guess some of you figured out today's my birthday. <laughs> and it's a big one. It's an ugly one. Number 70. So um, those of you who are in the live chat, you already figured it out. Thanks for the birthday wishes. Um, we're going to do some celebrating tonight. I got some uh, family dinner tonight. It's going to be real nice. And then Friday night, we're going to have a big blowout party. We're going to have about 30 people over here. Uh, dinner tonight, then um, the, the music and the cookout and all like that on Friday. We're going to make this a good one. At, at first, when my wife is asking, what do, you, what do you want to do for your 70th birthday? I said, well, maybe I can just go crawl under a rock and hide. Uh, but it's like, no, nah, let's get out there and celebrate, you know? <laughs> I mean, you only turned 70 once. I got a friend that um, sent me an email this morning saying uh, he hopes I have a set happy 71st birthday. And I sent him one back saying, no, you got it wrong. He said, no, this is your 71st birthday. Your first birthday was the day you were born. So your second birthday was when you were one. And now, and you know, you get it. It's like, it's like friends like that. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, but I'm 70. Um, and by, by the way, um, uh, one one of my favorite songs ever is uh, Dire Straits, The Sultans of Swing, and they've got a couple of concert songs where they do a smash up job of that. And I, I ran across just this last week a uh, uh, a video with um, uh, Mark Knopfler with uh, Dire Straits. Uh, they were playing at um, Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday, and I'm thinking, man, now that's a guy that has a good birthday party when they haul in the Dire Straits to come in and play for him. And then I look at the background, and guess guess what? They have Eric Clapton as Dire Straits' backup guitarist. And I'm thinking, man, alive. I, I wish I could have that for my 70th birthday. But, you know, Eric Clapton and, and Mark Knopfler are not going to be coming to my birthday. But we're going to have a nice time anyway. Uh, thank you all for, um, for, your, for mentioning it. I, I really appreciate it. Like I say, you only get uh, become 70 once. And um, by, by the way, okay, here, here's my little pet peeve. Uh, there'll be times when somebody, let's say, that's 38 years old is going to come up to me and say, hey, young man, how's your day going? And it's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you can't do that. You can't call me a young man. Because what they mean when they're 38 years old and they're looking at me and they call me young man what they're saying is, hey, I acknowledge you're pretty old, but I'm just trying to make you feel better. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> now, if an 84-year-old guy comes up to me and says, hey, young man, it's like, okay, that's valid. Uh, so anyway, just, just be careful. You know, sensitive souls like myself, you know how that goes. Okay, today we're going to be talking about, uh, I'm, I pick up on your questions. I like to pick up on a theme. And we're going to have, with all of these different questions, we want to zero in on how narcissists just keep proving their illogic. I, I want you to realize that so many of you share the same common uh, malady, and that is you, you want to bring reason and um, you know, just normal discourse with uh, the narcissist, and they don't do it. And one of the things that can keep you stuck in the snares with them is it's like, but they need to start being more logical. And let, let's keep in mind, they are defined by definition by their own false self. Uh, emphasize false. It's not accurate. It's not true. And so uh, they, they have to come up with all sorts of concoctions and rationalizations and projections, et cetera, so that they can keep themselves from examining who they are. And so what they do is they just uh, they have word salads, they have triangulations, they have projection, they have all these different defense mechanisms, anything to, to make themselves not have to not examine who they are. And that presents its own fair share of conundrums for you. So uh, as we uh, think about that, we're going to go into our questions and see how that uh, elucidates that very pattern they have. Now, the first first per, uh, question, and I don't know if, if I put this on here subconsciously at the top or not. I'm just thinking about this, um, you know, old and being getting older and all. Uh, but this one person writes in, emotionally, how do you come to terms with a narcissistic parent after they die? Now, I know that some of you have already uh, had the passing of a parent. Uh, and you, when you look back and you think about what that person was like, it's like, it wasn't very pretty. They, I, yeah, I want to love my mother. I want to love my father, but they just made it so difficult. And so here that person is dead. They're gone. They're, uh, they're finished, so to speak, although they still live on, don't they, inside of your mind and the minds of many other individuals. How do you come to terms with it when it's, um, 
it's 100 percent uh, clear now i can't talk with them anymore i can't sit down and and uh explain who I am or share uh, my preferences with them, it, it, it's, it will never happen. And you can have this permanent now loose endedness. Um, there, there are two things I'm hoping that you can do when, uh, when you look at, you know, the life of a narcissist and how it just didn't fit normal standards. It, it was chronically illogical. What are you going to do? Number one, I'm hoping that you can have as full of an insight about how that person came to be in the first place. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the more you realize that there were some forces at work with them that sadly they were unable to come to terms with, then you, you, it also reminds you, you know what? That person's blood is in my veins. And I, I'm part of that family lineage, and I need to uh, to be uh, aware of how they got to the place they are, so that I can then also uh, try to figure out who I am. And that's the second part of coming to terms with it, uh, when you think, okay, I need to learn about who they were and how they got there, and then I need to go ahead and personalize it. In my branch of the family tree, where am I going to go? And I know so many people who take their own family dysfunction and they just kind of fine tune it. And they make it their own. And that's, that's not the way it works, or at least not the way it ideally would work. Have you figured it out? Now, I, I've mentioned this before, but um, my, you know that I began my career with uh, uh, conducting a lot of anger workshops. And it's out of the anger workshops that I would do. And I would write about the topic and all. By the way, if you're looking for a good book, the, the book, The Anger Trap, is my best one on that one. Uh, but I would write about the topic. But there was a reason that I kind of subconsciously probably that I went into that. And that is because in the Carter family history, the men in particular were prone towards a lot of anger. Uh, my, my father had his issues. His father really had his issues. And then his father, um, this would be my great grandfather. Um, he was the meanest person, um, according to my own dad, that you'd ever want to meet. My father was dreadfully afraid of him just because he was so harsh. And, uh, you know, it's something that has just been passed down through the generations. And so here I go into the field of psychology and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to make a difference in the world in front of me. And it's not a shock that I decided, well, I want to help people figure that out because my reasoning is you can tell a lot about a person's maturity by watching how they manage conflict. And that's where the anger shows up. But that's, uh, that's an illustration of me saying, okay, there's some stuff in the Carter family history that I need to stay on top of. Um, what else do I need to do? And so rather than looking at uh, your family history, your parent who's now died saying, well, I hate that. That's no good understand what's going on and then resolve that your branch is going to be different. And then uh, you won't have complete closure with that person who has uh, passed and gone, but at least you can have a certain amount of comfort that says I'm, I'm able to, to rise up out of the ashes and, uh, and uh, reconstruct the way I'm going to be. And so my efforts are not in vain. I'm hoping you can think that way. Okay. And another person writes in, I'm having to end my 40 year marriage to a covert narcissist. The problem is he wants to know why I've told him about the numerous ways that he has hurt me profoundly in the past. And he labeled uh, this verbal diarrhea. So since I can't tell him he's a narcissist, I just don't have an answer that he will accept. How can I end this in a civil way? Okay. The very fact that, that you're having difficulty in communicating something that's of profound importance to you. I mean, the, the end of a relationship and then him responding the way that he does illustrates this is why I'm having to end the relationship. Uh, and, and just the insult, uh, just the ultimate insult. When you say, well, here's what's going on and here are the, the things that are bothering me. Um, and then he just said, well, you're just doing verbal diarrhea, which is that's what an insult. What an insult. Um, basically when you ask the question, um, how can I give him an answer that he will accept? The answer is you don't, that's why, that's why you're leaving. And, uh, narcissists have such an astonishingly low level of self-awareness. They're not introspective, at least not with respect to who they are and, and how they uh, come across the individuals. When you say, well, let me at least try to give him a good explanation. If, if you want to talk with him about your reasoning for leaving, uh, there is one thought that I would suggest that uh, at least will keep you out of the hooks a little bit. 
And that is don't focus on who he is rather than saying, well, you're argumentative or you're a negative person or you've constantly insulted me. Or every time I try to do something, you put roadblocks in front of me or <clears throat> you've been abusive. You can, you can say all those things about him. I think maybe a little better way for you to approach this is to talk about who you are in a positive way. And uh, I might even say something like one of the th one, 40 years in a marriage, I'm walking away. I might say something like one of the things that I want to accentu accentuate at this stage in my life moving forward is my self-respect. And I'm at a place to where I don't really respect where I'm at. I don't like what is going on inside of me. And, um, I, I just need to move on so that I can get myself into a better place. Now he's going to take it as an, a, you know, an offense against him. Well, what are you, you, you saying that I'm a terrible person and I'm just going to sidestep that. Uh, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm saying that I, I need to go into a different phase and that's what I'm going to do. Keep it uh, plain and simple like that. And then when he clearly tries to challenge that or tell you that it's no good, remind yourself that's what he does because he can't think analytically and I'm going to basically at that point say, uh, that's my reasoning. I know you don't understand, but that's my reasoning. And you don't have to have that uh, ultimate uh, closure because if you were able to take communications to a closure with someone like him, you might not need to be divorced in the first place. But the fact that uh, that you can't have closure, you don't have understanding, that's just all the more rationale. Plus, who knows what kind of experiences you've had. Uh, just make it about yourself in a healthy way. And then when he uh, predictably pushes back, then at some point just cease and know we're going to have a loose endedness, but I'm going to be connected with under, other individuals who do know how to talk with me in a mature way and in a way that says, I'd like to know you and understand you more fully. Narcissists can't do that. Um, stay succinct and then move forward. Uh, loose ends. <clears throat> um, okay. And we're going to continue uh, here with this. And, and again, I know you want to apply logic to a situation that's not logical. Here's another illustration. Anytime I try to express myself about how I feel about a person, place, or thing, she tells me why I'm wrong uh, to have the point of view uh, or the feeling that I have. It's gotten much worse over the years, and I loathe going out with her. I mean, I was expressing feelings, and yet she disagreed with my feelings. Um, <coughs> so here, <coughs> excuse me. So here you have a situation. Uh, it sounds like this is a a friend uh, that this person uh, is talking about, and uh, you express a thought or a feeling or a point of view, and you get the uh, put down or the uh, invalidation. And you're thinking it's just a feeling and a narcissist is like, I, I can't deal with that. <laughs> you want to hear a funny illustration, uh, the kind of off to the side, I, I may have given this before, but, uh, this is years ago, 20 years ago, my brother was at my house and we were having a nice dinner and I offered him a glass of wine. And, uh, when I did, he looked at me and said, Hey, you got any, sh uh, sweet and low. <laughs> I said, sweet and low. He said, yeah, for my wine. And, um, I said, you put sweet and low in your wine? He said, yeah. I said, I've never heard of anybody doing that. And he looked at me and he just very flat, uh, plainly said, it's just a preference. And I thought, well, you got me on that. I don't put sweet and low in my wine. Actually, I don't drink any wine anymore because I get headaches now. Uh, but uh, it's, it's like, um, okay, that's your preference. That's where you are. Uh, here's the sweet and low. It's in that cabinet right over there. You can go get it. Um, narcissists are so inclined to think, yeah, but it all has to be my way. You have to think like me. You have to act like me. You have to prioritize like me that when some sort of loose endedness comes along, it's like, no, you can't do that. And it's like, well, it's just a preference. Uh, that's how I feel. That's what I think. And rather than sitting down saying, well, tell me why you feel that way. Or uh, what's the backstory with that? I, I'm, I'm curious to know. And they really want to know and understand you more fully, thinking, well, this would be an opportunity for me to uh, comprehend who you are on a much deeper level. That's called intimacy. I like that. Narcissists can't do uh, deal with that. Um, one of the things we talk about is how narcissists approach relationships as a, a performance. They use a lot of binary thinking, black, white, all or nothing. because, And then when emotions show up, they can't deal with it because emotions don't fit into tight binary slots. 
uh, they, they just are what they are. And sometimes they feel arbitrary. Sometimes they don't have a whole lot of, of um, a rationale, at least to the other person. And so rather than saying, well, uh, truth, logic says that, you know, we all differ. So that's your preference. That's your interpretation. I can flow with that. It doesn't even have to agree with mine. You are who you are. That's a, that's a core level of acceptance that they can't go there. Now, why is that? And the answer is because they don't know what acceptance feels like. They themselves haven't felt accepted. And this goes back to that very first question about what do you do when you have a narcissistic parent that uh, passes? And my answer is learn from it. Narcissists don't learn. They just perpetuate the very dysfunction they've experienced. And rather than thinking, I want to I want to make this world a little better place because of my presence in it. It's like, no, if this world is broken, I'm just broken right along with it. And I'll just keep doing the same broken thing everybody else does. And your response as a growing person is, but that's illogical. And the narcissist says, that's me. Okay. And so uh, when you're, when you have a friend that just wants to argue subjectively about, you know, what you experience or what you feel, know that you're just going to have to keep it incredibly basic. If you're going to stay in that relationship at all. Uh, it's like, yeah, well, uh, the sky is blue today, isn't it? Or they say it's supposed to rain or, oh, I see you have that red dress on. You must like red. I, I just keep it like that. And I might talk about how I enjoyed that dinner or I, I had a conversation with this person and they seem to be doing well. And you're just going to have to keep it shallow. This is not somebody that can go into any kind of complexity with you at all. And um, the illogic uh, is, but isn't that what the relationships are all about to know each other in the fullest and most complex uh, ways as we're able and the narcissist is like, don't even go into that space with me. I don't do that. Uh, and it's just not in their skill set. Okay. Now, this next one. And uh, okay, just you, uh, hear it out and see what you think about this one. This person says, my narcissistic brother tries to start arguments with me, even when it's something I've already talked with him about and we agree. Why does he start arguing or conversations with animosity for no reason? So here you, uh, you, you've uh, sat down and you had a conversation with your brother and, and it may be that you're talking about an event going on inside the family. It may be that you're telling that, uh, that brother about the, uh, uh, the, the project that you're working on or a group of people you're do, doing some things with. And the brother comes along and says, oh, that sounds nice. And uh, tell me about it. And you think, okay, well, I've got a, we, we have a nice meeting of the minds here today. Next day, uh, the, the narcissist, narcissistic brother can come back and say something like, uh, yeah, you were talking yesterday about something. Uh, why, why did you think something like that anyway? And you're thinking, I, I thought we had a pleasant meeting of the minds. I thought we were kind of connected. And one of the things that's, that's just fascinating to me is that narcissists can do connection only up to a point. It's like, well, connection means that I let go of my need for power and I just consider you to be an equal. I consider you to be somebody who is intriguing and uh, I, I, I'd like to know more of you. In other words, I'm not so into me. I'd like to uh, get into you. And it's like there's a switch that, uh, or a timer that goes off where the narcissist says to oneself, okay, you've done that enough. You can't keep doing it. And then they go back to their contrarian ways. And you're thinking, but I, I thought we were kind of flowing pretty well. And the narcissist is thinking, I can only do connection up to a point. Don't expect me to get any further than that because that's uh, that takes me out of my comfort zone. That takes me out of my power place. And uh, I don't want to do tenderness or encouragement too much. I'm not very good at it. Plus, um, I kind of like being in the top dog position and, and uh, that, that gets me out of that. And so, so much of this is going on in them on a subconscious level. They're, they're hardly even aware that that's what's happening. But when you pull it down and ask, well, there's got to be a something behind it then you begin realizing they're in constant compensation mode. And uh, one of the things we know about narcissism is they have to be in control and your emotions are not uh, predisposed to fitting into tight slots. In other words, it's, it's kind of hard to say, well, my emotions are going to be A, B, and C. And it, it's not like it's a project or it's a point one, two, and three that you're working on. Emotions are just what they are. 
And it's like, no, that, that's, that's, too, um, that's too complex for me. And it requires me to get out of me. I don't want to do that. And so uh, you're going to need to remind yourself when you are engaging with that person, it's going to be very limited uh, in terms of having that heart connection because it's just something that they're afraid of. And they certainly don't have enough of an experiential base to draw upon. And so they'll go back and, and um, create a problem where you thought there was a good, and yet it's like, mm, problem is my, is my norm. Um, of course, it's always your fault, isn't it? Okay, this next one has a little um, odd kind of element to it, but this next question, it says, question from me, from me, okay. Narcissists, I know they're very secretive. Even when they're on their cell in elevators, they won't talk about themselves. Is that typical? So apparently this person is picking up on the fact that uh, that person is talking to me on the cell phone. They're in an elevator. Nobody's going to hear. So they don't have to worry about putting on airs. And the implication is, uh, is, is that something they just do? And let's keep in mind, there's a, a much, much bigger force going on when narcissists become deeply secretive. It, yeah, I mean, it's tied to their need for control. It's like, you'll know about me on a need to know basis. But it's, it's at a deeper level, it's like, I don't like who I am. I don't like people knowing my failures. I don't like people knowing my personal business. I don't like people knowing why or how I reason or why I do things. The narcissists carry a certain amount of self-loathing on the inside of themselves. And uh, rather than saying, well, if you're going to know me, you might as well just know the full me because uh, that way we're going to have a much a cleaner relationship. That's called authenticity, by the way. It's like, Ooh, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't do that. And so it's like when she says, uh, even when he's on a cell phone in an elevator, it they, they doesn't even have an audience except me, I guess. It's like, well, you're the audience then. And narcissists are so committed to, uh, to their secrecy because they don't like uh, what could be revealed about who they are. It's, it's all about image control and they're, they're in tight defenses. You know, one of the, that Freud was, was the one that really uh, came up with the notion of narcissists being defined by their defense mechanisms. And, and I think that was a good contribution that he made to the field of psychology because once you start seeing it, it's like, man, it's everywhere. And it's, it's not logical, but you see uh, narcissists uh, being self-absorbed and controlling and all. It's the, the whole premise of narcissism is built upon illogic. And none of it makes sense or none of it is going to go into a good way. And so the narcissist says, I'm doing it anyway. Okay, so it's not, not surprising that offshoots like their secrecy are going to be an ongoing thing. And, you know, I, I've talked with so many individuals, whether it's somebody that's been in an affair or somebody that wastes money or somebody that doesn't do a job in the way that they promised they were going to do it or, or whatever it might be. They, they, uh, they're chronically tardy or whatever their problem is or critical. Uh, when you sit down and say, hey, let, let's talk about all of that. It's like um, you're not allowed to go into that space with me. And they, they don't want to analyze because uh, in, their, in their mind, that means giving up power and their secrecy is part of their feeling like they have power when in fact what they have is toxicity. And that's, that's their, uh, that's their um, uh, exchange that they carry on the inside. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Okay, now I, I went ahead and included this next question. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is I, I, I get a question like this coming uh, question almost every week. And in fact, sometimes several of them. Um, and um, the reason that I, it, it, this is one of the most difficult questions. And a lot of times I pass over it because uh, there's, there's not a great answer to it. And I've already answered it before, but because it keeps coming up, I'm going to go with it again anyway. This person says, how do parent-in-laws deal with a narcissistic daughter-in-law who has isolated their son and grandchildren from them. How do we begin to live with this situation? How do we maintain a relationship with our son? Um, like I say, that's an extremely common theme, and I have lots of questions on that. And the answer is it may not work out the way you want. The answer is, well, this daughter-in-law uh, has married in to your son's life. 
she's taken over high control and has convinced him that he doesn't need to have uh, contact with you. One of a, a narcissist tactics often is to isolate their key person from people who might call them out. And so that's very common. And as the time has gone on, they've had a child or children. And now you as the grandparent have been alienated for no particular reason other than you're not like that daughter-in-law. And so uh, your, your thinking is, surely there's an answer. What if there's not? That's the hard one. You know, if, if I had the magic words, I would, I would put them out in all caps and, you know, do the airplane, um, you know, smoke, uh, smoke riding in the sky and all like that. Here, here's the answer. Sometimes narcissists are so deeply committed to their pathology that no matter how much reason, no matter, no matter how much common sense, no matter how much decency you appeal to them with, They'll look at you and, and um, flip the bird and say, up yours. I don't care. That's the way some of them are. And I, I, I don't mean to be crass and cruel, but some of them genuinely are so completely and totally self-absorbed and they're so drunk with their power that it's like, I, if you call me out on something, I'm just going to make it worse. And and so they, they'll turn to me, those people who are being alienated, and they'll say, well, Dr. Seen, what, what's, the, what's the answer? The answer is you've got a very troubled person who actually happens to have a, uh, uh, a power capability that they know hurts you. And that person is, is demented enough to say, I'm, I'm willing to use this. And they do. And, and so when they say, yeah, but can't we uh, get her to understand this? And how do we have a good relationship with our son? And uh, what they're saying is, I don't like that answer. Uh, give me a better one. And my response is, but it's true. And that's one of the toughest things that we have to deal with. And, and as a therapist, I, I just sometimes feel really crummy when I have to more or less imply you're, you're, you're wanting something to happen that's not going to happen. And, and there are many variations of this, uh, this same theme. And part of you coming to terms with the narcissist is coming to terms with the fact that pain exists and some pain just simply cannot be removed. I, I'm not being uh, mean toward you. I'm not being harsh when I say uh, you have a daughter-in-law who has, is training uh, key people in your life to hate just like she hates. And you, you can complain, you can protest, you can say it's not fair. And my response to all of that would be, yes, I, I hear you. And I do. And yet it's still true. So I know that there are times when, uh, when you want to make the external life better. Uh, other times you're reminded that sometimes the best I can do is uh, at least hold on to my integrity. And if circumstances change. I'm, I'm, at least I won't have added more to it. Um, but if circumstances change, I've got my integrity to fall back on. And if they don't change, I still have my integrity. And sometimes you walk with what I refer to as a psychological limp. And there are a lot of people who are limping out there. Uh, trust me, it's not it's not just a few. Uh, and and again, it, it may be parental uh, parental alienation, grandparent alienation. It may be that you're in a social situation where friends cut you off for poor reasoning, and it makes no sense. But there it is. It may be in a work setting where you've got all the skill set, but you have a, a, a manipulative, exploitive boss or supervisor or an undermining coworker. I mean, the possibilities are endless. And so sometimes you have to learn how to live with loose endedness and then you take, you don't deny it, but then you remind yourself that's not the sum total of everything that makes up my identity. And, and I know that's hard, but I wanted to go ahead and put that out here today as a reminder, because it's a question that just keeps coming up. So my heart goes out to you and, uh, and I, I want you to be a person of dignity and respect and civility, even if you have this painful situation. Okay. Okay, that's, 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 that's really crummy, isn't it? But here we go. Okay, another question. This is all about flying monkeys. This person says, why do flying monkeys put the narcissist on such a pedestal? 
I can't understand how my family can overlook the fact that my mother told me at a dinner party that I shouldn't have been born. How can they not reject that? It's not even possible for me to talk with them about that. So here you have a person. I'm going to guess that this may be the youngest kid. You know, there, there's a buddy of mine who, who's uh, the youngest of four, and his his next oldest uh, or next or next closest sibling is like ten years older, and he jokingly refers to himself as the oops child. Um, but he can he can talk about it. His parents they, they've never told him that. But you know, it's a, it's kind of a funny kind of thing. Um, when we talk about um, flying monkeys. We're talking about uh, individuals who have a blind devotion to the narcissist. And so they go into an alliance with that narcissist because they're the ones who wields the strength. And that flying monkey thinks, well, maybe I can't become the one who wields the strength, but if I can uh, latch on to the one who has the strength and the power, then somehow I can win anyway. And so it's kind of like selling their soul to the devil. They, uh, they decide, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And I, I'm absolutely amazed when I see that, whether it's in politics or in family systems or business or social settings, you know, where you have the, uh, the, uh, the mean people that are the ones that are in charge and the others it's like, well, if you want anything done, I guess you have to align yourself to the mean person. Now here comes this person uh, who says, well, the uh, the uh, power uh, power narcissist in my family, my mother, said that she wished that I wasn't even born. And these flying monkeys, when I talk to them about it, uh, all they can say is pass the green beans. They, they don't get into it. They don't want to talk about it. It's like, well, that's, that's your problem. It's not my problem. And then we begin asking, well, are these flying monkeys themselves highly narcissistic? And by the way, I, I did a video on this, maybe as much as a couple of years ago now, I can't remember, but the, my answer is, yeah, uh, there's, there's kind of this under the radar. I'll let the narcissist be <laughs> the bad person. I'm just going to kind of go along to get along, but ultimately vicariously, it's like, good. Uh, those people out there that differ from the narcissist and therefore by extension, me, they're going to get their come up and, and they sit there and gloat quietly. And then when you ask what's going on, it's like, not me, it's that person over there. And it's, it's the ultimate passive aggressiveness. And so um, basically the, the flying monkey without using words, and this is their illogic, they're saying, well, I too am a highly selfish person, but I feel too weak to be honest about that. So this is my way of finding power. I lock into a very important person, the VIP, and I secretly drain their power and make it my power, and I win. So what you've got here is uh, the flying monkey actually is part of a collective, and uh, and that's where they're coming from. And uh, you, you can kind of consider it to be a compliment when they more or less imply, you're not in our group. <laughs> and it's like, good. Uh, you remember the old Groucho Marx uh, thing about wanting to be in a country club and, uh, and then they turned him down and he, his comment was, well, I wouldn't want to be in a club that would accept me anyway. I mean, that that's kind of where they are. This is a weird illogic uh, that's there. So that's what's going on and, and know what you're dealing with. And then remind you, you might want to ask yourself, do I have to have, that person's understanding in order for me to be okay. I know who I am. I know that uh, I'm glad I was born and I'm glad I'm here and I have positive things to contribute. And if none of them can appreciate that, I appreciate that. And so you lean into your own self-acceptance despite the narcissist and the flying monkeys uh, and flying monkeys are themselves uh, their own covert version of narcissists. Okay. That's, that's my take on it. Okay. Um, Okay, this, this is one when I talk about narcissists keep proving their illogic. This person, whoever it is, thank you for sending this, um, is somebody that's just drawn on straight up logic and reason. Okay, so this person says, Dr. C, why do narcissists seem to think that insulting and putting you down is going to go well? To me, that doesn't sound like a healthy relationship. Are they just wired differently? Well, um, 
y- yes, there are some individuals who are just, wi- but let, let's put it this way. There's some individuals who are wired to be very analytical and empathetic. I think some individuals have a natural uh, 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 predispos- uh, 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 predisposition toward that. Some individuals don't, but they can still learn it. But uh, the narcissist is thinking, well, I don't want to be analytical because uh, that means I have to look at me and I have to you know, figure out what I need to do to change. And I don't want to have to do that because that implies that I have to admit that I'm fallible and I don't want to admit that they have such a need to be on top and superior that somehow uh, admitting weaknesses and flaws is, uh, is, is scary to them. So what they've decided is, well, the best way for me to take care of my weak little childish uh, fragile ego is to, kick you in the shins. It's like, what? <laughs> and so this person is saying uh, that doesn't sound like a, uh, a healthy relationship relationship. And this is because it's not. Um, one of the, um, uh, the privileges that I had uh, was going through graduate school in my uh, early and mid twenties. And it frankly was my therapy. I, I was with professors and one in particular, and then I had my doctoral ad- advisor as well uh, at uh, the clinic that I did my internship at. Uh, they, they were more or less the ones that would challenge me uh, less thing before you can zero in on where everybody else is. Uh, have you thought about who you are and you know what's, what constitutes a, a healthy you? And it was so refreshing to have somebody talk with me in that kind of way. And I just lapped it up. And here I am at age 70, I'm still lapping it up. It's like, well, I, I'm always going to learn new things and I'm going to have insights or there are going to be some things that I'm reminded of that maybe I learned 35 years ago. It's like, oh, I, I forgot about that. Or I, I, I was so busy with other things that I, I just didn't put my attention on there. Healthy individuals want to grow. Healthy individuals want to keep learning. And if somebody comes along and says, I have an insight about you that I'd like to share, then it's like, ooh, well, tell me about it. Unhealthy people, it's like, nope, I'm a, I'm a finished product and you don't have the right to say anything about me. And then to, to remind you of that, then they remind you of how terrible and stupid and idiotic and illogical and, uh, you know, malintended and all the rest that you are. And it's their way of saying, well, I hope that protects me because I don't want to talk about me. And so they're insulting of you has no logic to it other than compensation. Uh, They're compensating for their own weak egos. And, uh, and so when they insult you uh, at at some point, it's reasonable to stand up and say, well, yeah, you and I clearly have a very different uh, point of view. I mean, it's okay to say something like that, but at some point it's like, why am I going to defend me to somebody that doesn't want to hear it anyway? Uh, My best defense is me being a decent person. And so when they say, I think you're stupid and you're ugly too, then my response is going to be, I, I realize that that's what you think. I, I think differently. And, and you just keep moving on with your own self-confidence. Um, that's their false superiority coming out. Uh, underscore the word false. Okay. Now, this next question, and I get this question quite a bit too. This person asks, is there some textbook that narcissists use they say the same things and do so many of the same things. How is this possible? Things that I've heard and seen from my ex narcissists are verbatim comments and identical treatment from other narcissists. I, I truly don't understand how they're so alike. <laughs> and it, it is like, you know, do they all draw from the same playbook? Well, let's keep in mind that there's this uh, kind of a contradictory term that our the statement I like to make, and that is we're all alike and we're each unique. We're all alike in that we have the same basic needs. I want to be loved. I want to be significant. I want to feel understood. I want to accomplish things. I want to uh, uh, to be uh, a person that has uh, joy and delight in my life. We, every one of us has uh, some level of that. We're all alike. We're each unique in that uh, whenever we um, come to that fork in the road thinking, well, uh, things aren't going very well, but I still have those core needs. Healthy people say, well, let me see if I can uh, uh, learn from my experiences and I can uh, um, uh, go down that path and be a difference maker in a healthy way. Narcissists is like, I'm going to take this path over here. And so they go into the path of negativity and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the path they take is destroy people. That way you win. 
or overpower people or hide who you are or tell lies. And it, it's kind of like once they go down that path, then the same choices are, are there for all of them that are on the path. And it's, it's kind of interesting that they, uh, that they can't think of uh, saying, you know, this is not working for me. I need to uh, go in the other direction, but uh, we do differ in the, the way that we approach different people and circumstances, but at the core, we all have the same needs and that sets up very much a predictability. Actually loving people can be predictable. Sometimes they're kind and they show understanding or they're patient in the way they uh, listen to you. So they can be out of the play, same playbook too. narcissists. They're, they're going into a different path, but it has the same uh, skills. If you will, if you want to put it that way uh, to draw upon. <sighs> okay. This person says, I understand why they are referred to as covert narcissists. They don't want anyone to know that they're narcissistic, so they keep it hidden. So this prompts my question. Do covert narcissists know they are narcissistic? At some level, it seems they're aware of it. Are they? And I think that that's a really good question. And this is one of those classic questions where you provide your own answer. Uh, uh, if I have to hide something, I'm thinking, well, the reason I'm hiding for it is for my own personal good. So let's uh, now, okay, you know, let's suppose that you uh, are going to surprise your spouse or a friend with a nice gift. And you think, well, I don't want them to know about it yet because I've got a really good thing that we're doing. So I hide it. For temporarily, because I know that I'm going to bring joy and I want to do it in an opportune way that allows them to have the, a maximal experience of happiness. Okay. So when you hide something, when you keep a secret in that kind of way, there's a reason behind it. And in that case, it's a good reason. Others though, it's like, well, I'm going to hide something too, but this isn't so much for me to edify you. This is for me to edify me. You see, I'm over here and I have all of these priorities that I don't want anybody to know about. So if you don't know about it, then I don't have to be accountable. So that, that benefits me. And so uh, the, uh, the fact that they hide it does, in fact, imply strongly, I know that you'll call me out on it. Well, why would you call me out on it? Well, at some level, they know because it's inappropriate or because it's selfish or because it's wrong, but I don't want to hear it. So I'm just not going to let you say that to me. I'll just keep a secret. <clears throat> so at some level, the the uh, the pervasiveness and the uh, the fullness of their secretiveness is their way of tacitly uh, implying, I know there's something screwed up inside of me. But uh, rather than saying that's a, Ooh, that doesn't sound good, let's just keep that cover up, and that way I don't have to deal with it. And it's it's this is why that they are unable to grow because again they have such a deep commitment to their own false self. Uh, I've got to keep that mask on because if you take the mask off, if you look behind the, the curtain to see what's really going on there, I have so much pain. I have so much uh, turmoil, so many questions. I don't know what to do with it. They have their own bewilderment that they have never been able to come to terms with. And so they decide I'll become a giver of bewilderment. I'll become a giver of chaos. And that way we'll focus on that. And I don't have to deal with me. And it's the proverbial kicking the can down the road. Um, so that's where they are. So all of this sounds really illogical, Dr. C. And the answer is, yeah, I know. It is illogical. Uh, and yet that's where they are. And I'm hoping you can decide, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my experiences with these individuals. And even if it's a very painful experience, like those grandparents who are being blocked from their grandchildren, uh, even if it's very uh, painful, uh, I, I'm going to accept the fact that pain is there I'll, as, as I'm able. Yes, I will have my assertiveness and I will stand up for myself. But when the narcissist proves to be so completely illogical that they're immovable, then I need to move away from their influence. And I need to make sure that I am committed to healthiness. And, and hopefully you can find other people on your team healthy that will join you in that. Uh, there, there's nothing more gratifying than for you to know, even though I'm around other individuals who don't have integrity, my integrity is intact and I'm, I'm okay with being me. And in the end, I'm hoping that's something you can cling to and the narcissist can't take that away from you. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up. And, and once again, thank you for the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. I'm going to go out to dinner with some family tonight. And then Friday night, we're going to have the big party and all like that. And, uh, 
dire straits and Eric Clapton aren't going to be there to play for my 70th birthday, but I can, I can live with that. I'll just put them on stereo. Hey guys, I uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. I'll see you next time. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the comments section below and we'll pick up on them and uh, we'll uh, go with more uh, same time, same station next week. See ya. Bye-bye.